So I've been f- reflecting on the last couple of weeks of topics, what to do when you get triggered and what to do when they get triggered. And also obviously reflecting on the state of the world and so many things that can rattle and disturb us and disturb other people, including, you know, in my own home with my own marriage or kids, work, projects, aging body. Life is wiggly, as Alan Watts put it. Things are disturbing. And I wanted to explore one aspect of this that's become very kind of close to heart for me recently. And it has to do with what happens when another person gets triggered and we lose track of their innermost being. We lose track of the things they really care about or the reasons why they're re- they are reacting in the ways that they are that could well be very problematic for us. We lose track of that. And one of the things that happens when we lose track of what's really going on under the surface in another person, uh, uh, that's involved when we get triggered. That supports or increases us getting tr- triggered about them. So I want to start with one of the most useful models I know of the psyche. And I've learned quite a few, and this one is really simple and really, really good. It kind of describes us, and I'll use myself a little bit here as an example. It describes us as like three concentric circles. The outermost circle is called the act. It's what we present to the world It's what we want the world to think we are, and it's what we want to think we are. So growing up, you know, I was trained to be smart, good student, very well behaved, quiet, stay out of trouble, uh, avoid causing offense, be nice, be rational, be polite. That was my presentation. And it was useful in some ways. The act our act isn't inherently bad, and there's certainly a place for uh, sort of managing our presentation to some extent, particularly in certain situations. The kind of behavior that would be very appropriate partying with friends on the beach would be very inappropriate at, let's say, a memorial service or funeral um, for someone. So, you know, there's the act. Now, underneath the act, the second circle in, is what's called the scared self. And what that means basically is these are the parts of ourselves that we don't want to think are part of ourselves. We sure don't want others to see are part of ourselves. These are the parts of ourselves we push away. You know, in, in my case, growing up, pushing away feelings, pushing away kind of more irrational imagistic, nonverbal processes, whoa, intuition, push it away. Uh, self, you know, revealing weakness, whoa, push that away. Revealing fear, push that away. Revealing that I was hurt by something or how I was treated, whoa, push that away. That's the territory of the scared self. And one way to kind of think about uh, what's in the scared self uh, territory is to ask yourself, uh, what sorts of things do you dread experiencing and do everything you can to avoid? The dreaded experiences that we avoid risking are definitely in the mix in our scared self. And then the third circle in, at the core of it all, is our being. And there are levels to this. One level is quite ordinary. Uh, Kind of what's your deep nature as a person? Uh, Are you, by nature, uh, kind of caring by nature? Are you exploratory? Uh, Does your nature, uh, is your nature musical? Do you have a strong bent in that direction? Uh, Like me, is your nature uh, kind of drawn to the edges of things, you know, to exploration? Do you maybe related to that, like wilderness a lot, um, 
Is it your nature to really, really value hearth and home? You know, kind of what's in your nature as a person, even sometimes deeper than personality, deeper than gender socialization, just your nature. And then under that even um, is a wakefulness, an awareness, a knowingness, a beingness that feels definitely deeper than personality and even gender. It's just, it's a, it's a beingness, really, that can start to feel that it's tapping into something transpersonal. So you could see these three circles, right? And so much of the journey of personal growth <clears throat> is to gradually resource ourselves to uh, loosen up the act and allow more of the scared self material to be integrated and expressed, including in vulnerable ways that sometimes are kind of messy when you first start, but you've got to you've got to let it out, you know, to kind of get going with this. Uh, a lot of the personal growth process is to slowly crack the armor of the act and to not feel so tightly bound by it as a kind of fabric maybe we needed to weave growing up to get through life and polish and perfect and paint so it's all pretty. And we need to take risks and let our acts crack and kind of fall open and get more in touch with and reveal more of that scared self so that the radiance of our true nature, both just our natural disposition and temperament and, and qualities and what we like, as well as our really deep nature can just shine through, can just shine through. And that's a pretty good description, I think, of a lot of the, the process of healing and growth. And you might ask yourself, to what extent are you still constrained or burdened by an act? Um, that was necessary to develop years ago uh, and which maybe is not so necessary today. And you could afford to loosen up, lighten up, and, and let your full self more and more shine through. You might ask yourself that. And you might ask yourself, huh, given if you were like me, that the prospect of that was close to terrifying <laughs> initially, <laughs> what would help you? What would help you be more relaxed about revealing weakness or not knowing? What would help you be more in touch with the softer feelings that can be under the act of a brittle anger or righteousness or criticism of others, a criticalness? You know, can you, what would help you, uh, you know, feel more and open up more to yourself? And how can you? Develop that inside yourself. Uh, meditation, by the way, is a very wonderful way to become more integrated because as we be present with ourselves and we stop doing the typical things that keep the scared self at bay by solving this or accomplishing that or interacting with other people or giving ourselves various pleasures, as we do that, more of that scared self material starts bubbling up. It's there. It's there to be known. It's there to be experienced. It's there. Can you let yourself feel it? You know, when it's there and in feeling it, can you experience it out? Can you allow it to flow? Uh, meditation is very useful in that way. Meditation is also very useful to help us stabilize a felt knowingness of that third innermost circle, the bullseye right there at the center of it all, you know, in your, in your real being, right? You kind of Take your stand there increasingly as you meditate and you come home to it again and again and again, a kind of stability of beingness and presence that has a sense of intactness and all rightness in and of itself. Fundamental, fundamental process, right? The fundamentals. I said tonight I was going to focus on the fundamentals really of meditation and this, these are the fundamentals in a lot of ways around uh, healing and growth. Okay. Well, with that as a bit of a model, sometimes what can happen with other people, including people that are very close to you, is that they can start to bother you. 
Anybody been bothered by ever someone close to them? Yeah. No, I see Kathleen going, no, no, never, never. Oh, Art, you are so lucky, Art, her husband. She's never been bothered by you. Amazing, amazing. So we get bothered by people. Stuff happens. We get bothered by them on TV. You know, we get bothered by them uh, on the other side of the bed or the table or the, the office cubicle or in the other lane driving along, you know. Uh, we get bothered by them. And I want to be really clear, nothing I'm talking about here is about giving up about dealing with injustice or not standing up for yourself in appropriate ways. And, and, I'm, and I'm also certainly not talking about not protecting yourself and those you care about. I'm focusing kind of psychologically and in terms of our communication with other people. So if somebody bothers you, and I really encourage you to bring to mind some kind of recent tiff or something or other. I can think about a little back and forth with my wife, Jan, my long-suffering wife, Jan, earlier today. I could think about relationships. I could think about a dear friend. I just, it's his birthday today. And I just talked with him before we started this. And, you know, he bothered me some years ago when he started um, kind of coming at me more holistically about the ways we overlap in our political views, but it's not 100% and he was going after me. So we get bothered. Then what? So in the last couple of weeks, we've explored a, kind of a lot of how-tos about uh, what to do about that and so forth. But I wanna talk about something new, something fresh about all that, which is the process when we're bothered by someone or we notice that they're rattled in some way can we avoid getting um, stuck in their surface? And instead, can we help ourselves slow down to become more aware of some key things? First, what do they want really deep down? Why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? The expression of their want might be real problematic. They might say, I want you to stop doing this or start doing that. But underneath it all, deep down, what do they want to experience? What are the positive wants that underlie negative behavior? What's underneath it all for them? And I cannot begin to tell you, well, I can begin to tell you, I cannot end telling you, I cannot tell you completely and adequately how valuable it's been for me when I'm on my game, to really slow down and ask myself, what do they really want here? What do they want from me? How do they wish it would go from now on? How do they wish it had gone in the past? Like, what's, what's the, what are the real stakes here? We're having this kind of proxy war about, in my example, um, loading the dishwasher uh, or you know some detail of how we work together. But underneath it all, what? What's the real concern? What's the hot button for them? What's, what's the real stake on the table, which might be uh, that they want to feel closer or maybe they want to feel more separated, right? Maybe, they, maybe they're very prickly about the appearance of domination or they, they can't tolerate or are very upset about the thought that they're being criticized here. When in fact, actually, you're not trying to criticize them. You're just trying to get to the bottom of what are the facts? You're know, like, what happened here? No praise, no blame, just what happened? Like, so what, what's underneath it all? You could think about a recent upset. You could think about an ongoing difficulty. You could think about relationships in your past, as I, I certainly can. Wow, I sure wish I'd had the wherewithal to slow it down and either ask about what's really go, what, what are you really wanting here? What, what would it look like if you got what you wanted? Um, how have I landed on you in a way that's made you so angry? I'm like, what, what, was th what was thwarted in you? What was taken away from you? What do you fear could be taken away from you? What, do you, what are you worried about? How do you fear you could be harmed? Right? And maybe we can only ask these questions inside our own minds because it's not appropriate to talk about them with the other person. Maybe, maybe the other person would just blow you off, but at least inside ourselves, what are the underlying aims? 
We are motivated animals, continually leaning in to the future to get what we need, which could include a, you know, getting away from threats of various kinds. We, we want things. What does that other person want? That's a really good question. A second is to track the underlying mood. People may present in that outer shell, their persona, their sleeve, it's sometimes talked about distinct from the core, the sleeve that wraps the core. That outer shell could look all put together, could look all happy. I think about American culture that's like, hey, we're all fine, you know, I grew up in LA, we're all good, it's all great, you know, yeah. But underneath it all, maybe the truth is their mood is depressive and they're covering it over with what's called the manic defense against depression, where they, they're busy, they're doing, they're full of projects, they're juggling all kinds of balls because they know if they slow down, that underlying depressed mood, even if it's not clinical depression yet, would catch up to them, right? So what's the mood underneath it all? And sometimes the mood underneath it all could really surprise you. I've, you know, I'm perceptive and trained as a therapist, I've just been totally stunned by how people that I've been close to uh, had an underlying mood that I had no sense of. They wouldn't, they didn't reveal it. And if I rewound everything, maybe I kind of could have guessed better, but it sure wasn't that obvious. But mood shapes everything. As you know from the inside, if your mood is depressive or anxious, melancholy, uh, feeling inadequate, feeling irritable, exasperated, put upon, uh, aggravated, you know, you know, kind of inclined to go aggro, you know you're really affected by that mood. I mean, there's a lot of research on how thoughts shape feelings. Well, I'll tell you, there's a, a lot of the people who are into that research are very cognitive, you know, <laughs> but people who are in touch with their feelings really understand <laughs> how feelings shape thoughts, right? Uh, so what's the mood? in that other person that's shaping things. Is there anything you can do about it? I don't know, but at least you can understand it. What's going on underneath it all, right? Um, yeah. And I think when we really ask ourselves about the interior of other people. On the one hand, it's important certainly to be discerning. On the other hand, it's really important to check our assumptions, right? And to realize that it's not, we don't always know what's going on inside that other person. We might think that they're just being a real pill. Or we might think that <clears throat> they're, you know, punishing us. We might take it personally. When in fact to them, they are just awash in sadness and loss and, and, and self-doubt and self-loathing that we, you know, have no idea about. And they're irritated with us maybe a little bit, but mainly they are just, they're just underwater in their own world. Now, to repeat, and I, I see Lubko's question here um, at 701, if I follow it, to repeat, nothing I'm talking about is about waiving your own rights, and you may need to sequence what I'm talking about differently. You might need to really take care of yourself initially and you know, get that person out of your face and or out of your bed or your company and then start sorting it out. Maybe you have to act really, really quickly. But as soon as you can, I can tell you, especially if it's a significant relationship, asking yourself, what's going on inside their scared self? What's going on in their deeper layers that could be really relevant to take into account? Then we are in the details of, can we ask them about it? Can we ask third parties about it? Can we drag them into a therapy about it? Can we just slow it down enough to, to, to be more empathic with what's going on? But I really want to kind of emphasize this notion of what lies beneath the surface. Now, in the time of the Buddha, with an incredible psychology of suffering 
and its causes and the causes of its end. The Buddha did not have access to a modern psychology of personality. Uh, he did not have access to the developments with Freud and Jung and, and all kinds of other people's internal family systems, uh, Richard Schwartz, uh, part selves, gestalt, alter egos, you know, the dynamic multiplicity of the forces inside, uh, you know, like neo-Jungian stuff. Just didn't have that. There, there wasn't really much of a discussion of unconscious processes, inner conflict. There was a little bit of a theorizing after the Buddha died about storehouse consciousness and tendencies underneath it all, but it just wasn't very elaborated. So you don't find much of what I'm talking about in the Buddha Dharma. You find um, an emphasis on, you know, sila, morality ourselves, virtuous conduct ourselves, and which includes non-harming. You, you find an emphasis on compassion, but you don't really find much of a focus on um, insight into the depths of other people or ourselves. And I can tell you from hanging out in some Buddhist circles that some of the Buddhist teachers I've hung out with or I've heard about could really have used greater self-knowledge of their own depths, as well as taking into account the depths inside other people. So, so far, and maybe I'll extend this a little further and we'll open it up for discussion. So quick review. I've talked about and I've invited you to consider how it might be really helpful, including the next time someone around you is troubled by something, maybe it's you, to ask yourself or to, and even explore if you possibly can, what are the deeper wants here? What's been thwarted? What's been disappointed? What do they feel worried about? Um, what are the deeper wants here? Second, what's the underlying mood? Mood in general. Um, and as part of that, their physiology. Sometimes we overestimate the capacities of other people because their physiology is different from ours. You know, they, they're dealing with chronic pain and they're just getting worn down. My friend dealing with a lot of chronic health issues as he gets older. Um, you know, we can, we can underestimate the capacities of other people, but we can also overestimate them. And overestimating them or is not a matter of contempt, although contempt, you know, can get it. It's, it's really separate. We might realize, wow, you know, I'm asking you to do something that you just can't do. I'm asking you to lift 50 pounds. You just can't do it more than once. And to really take that into account and a person's mood and more broadly their physiology, the status of their immune system, how much chronic pain they're dealing with, how frayed the insulation is metaphorically, although literally as well, on their the wiring in their nervous system. Stress demyelinates, you know, axons. Stress removes the insulation on those wires, you know, concretely, but more broadly and metaphorically, you know, they just... They can't hang in there after more than five minutes. They're just flooded. They're out. Maybe they're because their trauma history. There's a lot of stuff there. You know, it's just taking that into account. It's what I mean by mood and physiology. And then last, to really double check your um, assumptions about them, uh, in, including what you think is going on or what you what's the real issue is or something else. And like, really, are you so sure? Is there more to find out? What's going on in their interior? Last thing I want to say, and it has to do with a conversation, uh, I believe that Forrest and I had with Galen Ferguson, a wonderful teacher, professor at Nalantno, um, Naropa University, uh, Galen, Dr. Ferguson, and deep, deep Tibetan practitioner of Tibetan Buddhism, scholar. Uh, and I asked him, so what for you is really a fundamental edge for you in practice. What, what's a real highlight? What are you focusing on here? And he said one word that I've just thought of a lot ever since, welcoming. Welcoming what arises, welcoming what lies beneath the surface, and welcoming that in other people. And you can feel it. You can feel it in someone who welcomes you and is welcoming to all of you. Isn't it an incredible feeling? I, I had a 
high school teacher that was like that cha kind of changed my life a little bit. You know, a 10th grade teacher, he had a open lunch hour. People could come in, drop in a lot. He just sat there and ate his lunch alone. You know, I suspect he didn't feel that welcome in the faculty lounge. Um, and yet he was very welcoming. And I could feel that I could tell him anything. He, he was welcoming. And so that enabled me to slowly relax my own act around him and to reveal more of my own interior, welcoming. You can also feel it when you're with people who are not welcoming. I think one of the most beautiful gifts we can offer to others is to be welcoming of all of who they are. We may need them to slow down. We might need to say, hey, I really want to welcome what you're feeling, but when you're yelling at me, it's, you know, <laughs> sorry, I just can't do it. You know, can we slow it down? Can we step back? Can we soften the tone? Can we turn down the volume um, to be able to continue to welcome you? But is there a welcoming? Can, are you, can you tolerate the wild, passionate, weird, sometimes strange, sometimes mm, kind of nasty stuff inside every person? including the person sitting across from you at lunch. Can you welcome that, right? Welcoming. Now I could say more about doing this with ourselves and maybe I'll just pause here because I can see a couple of hands have raised and um, why don't we do this? Why don't I bounce out to my friends, you know, Brenda and Najeli. I've spoken with you frequently before, which is great. And um, and then I'll come back. Then I'll come back to welcoming more of our own interior, which is really, really profound. So maybe uh, Najeli and then Brenda. So I'm asking you to unmute. Great. Great. Thank you. So um, I, just like you, uh, last week I, I was um, talking about this with my husband because what you said last week was uh, makes sense, but kind of in a superficial level because on the real deal when you're in the relationship it's hard and I also remembered a talk that you had with Forrest about the Enneagram and talking about that hurting self I think it's very important to really know where is your hurt in mm. the Enneagram type yeah. and also know where is the other one uh, because we are different and I think that's a very good uh, way to know the other person but my question, I mean, that's like, a, like an idea and I've been exploring and revising that, that theme of the Enneagram. I would like to know what you think about that. And also, what do you think if the other person is not interested in that kind of stuff and, yeah. and doesn't care to know which type it is, for example, and, and it's hard sometimes to know the, the hurt of that person. Yeah. Great question. So the Enneagram, for those who don't know, is a personality typing system, nine major types in it. Um, Ennea in Greek means nine. So that's where that Enneagram comes from, as you know, Najeli. And uh, there's a fair amount of dynamism and movement in the, the system. I consider it for myself, at least, the most informative personality typing system I know, which at the upper bound on a good day might account for roughly 50% of who a person is, you know, because we kind of, you know, there's more to us than that. So the question, I hear you really, I, I think it's really useful to understand tendencies. I think temperament is extremely useful to understand. Is a person more at the spirited ADHD end of the temperamental spectrum or more at the anxious rigid end as, for, as an example? Is a person temperamentally melancholy or anxious or irritable? Uh, or vulnerable to feeling bad about themselves. You know what's so these systems are really useful, uh, certainly for ourselves. Um, and then the question becomes, what about other people if they're not interested in that? Well, if they're not, they're not. You know, and uh, I find that you know there's a story you may have heard, Najeli. Uh, basically, uh, it's a true story. <clears throat> A young a woman went off to do a three-month retreat at the Insight Meditation Society. And before she returned home, she was really quite worried because she was going back to her family in the South, a very fundamentalist, Christian, politically conservative, loving, and still very somewhat rigid and traditional family. And how could she come home with her Buddhist realizations and 
she was worried about that. And then, you know, I, I don't know exact details, but I think apparently a month or two later, she wrote a letter to the teachers. And with their permission, with her permission, they, they actually shared portions of it. And the summary line that I think is actually really useful is she said about her family, um, they don't like it when I'm being Buddhist, but they love it when I'm being a Buddha. Others will do what they do, and we can, you know, walk our talk. Also, we can use what we perceive about them. You know, in the Enneagram, I'm a social seven, my wife's a six, and um, you'll understand, as Jelly knows what that means. And so I tend to be uh, somewhat playful and adventuresome and possibility thinking. She tends to be more cautious. Uh, we would bump into things around driving. I would want to zoom, zoom, get places, have more possibilities, have more fun, you know? You have more fun. <laughs> rolling stone doesn't gather a lot of moss, or as a rolling, as a Grateful Dead put it. And I, I took it personally when she would try to clamp down on me, my exuberance, my enthusiasm. So I just finally realized, oh, it's not so personal. But I didn't have to get into a lot of dialogue necessarily with her about it. It was just, oh, I could understand her better. So I think sometimes understanding other people in these simple ways are sufficient. Anyway, I wish you well with all that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Najeli. And then Brenda, Dr. Brenda. Uh, hi. Thanks so much. Uh, so I want to go back to something that I had mentioned in the chat and uh, Luko. I think was following right. on the a particular thing that I think we were both addressing, which also I was concerned about, Dr. Rick, when uh, from uh, the uh, discussion last week about what to do when others are triggered. With yeah. both of them, and maybe it's just my leaping sense of balance and fairness, in both uh, last week and what we're talking about now, my concern is what about your own fault? What about when, and I just had a thing with my husband this afternoon and uh, it was my impatience, it was my anger uh, and I saw him react and it wasn't so much that, but it really, it was my fault. Yeah. You know? So uh, uh, what, what Lutko was saying about not focusing on the other person, but it's possible that I'm doing, it's me, you know? So, just that, if you want to address oh, it. Oh, yeah. Well, if I get you right, uh, I would just say first, um, it, in real time, it's helpful to be aware of both, our, our interior and their interior, as best we can. And sometimes what's helpful is to, start, is to do is to start with classic nonviolent communication, where essentially we say, you know, when this happened here. When you used those words or when this event occurred, I experienced something. And I'm not blaming you for it. I'm just saying when I experienced it because deep down I need this and that. All right. So we're, we're speaking there already about our own interior. We're talking about our own interior there. So sometimes that's where we start. I think that's true. Um, I find that um, the point I'm trying to make is that I think a lot, including in modern societies, we interact with each other sleeve to sleeve, act to act. On the outside, yeah. Yeah, persona yeah. to persona, mm -hmm. rather than core to core. And there's certain situations where it's appropriate to just have a superficial, formal relationship, but you know, in our practice and in our lives, in our own healing and, and growing, so much is missed out when we, we have that kind of superficial, sleeve to sleeve, protected, managed, almost machine-like way of relating with other people. I'm, I'm really trying to surface this as a general point. And uh, now I would say for myself, I have, you know, a, a kind of switch flipped, a light went on early, somewhere in my, I don't know when, early in my marriage, 
when I realized that the fastest way to get people off my back <laughs> and to get back to that happy place that as a seven, <laughs> I prefer to hang out in, right? A harmony and let's just keep going. What can we do next? You know, that kind of thing. And, and also to uh, be, be moral, to be virtuous. To, to be appropriate, the best thing I could do for me was to quit fighting their critique of me and take maximum personal responsibility, implement correction, know that I'm going to do that, and move on. Cop to it. In other words, the faster that I can cop to it and get off it, get off my position, it became a game. How quickly and you know, in proportion to the difficulty, right? Like in gymnastics, it's easy to have a perfect landing of a relatively easy maneuver, but throwing a double half pike back twist with I have no what else, you know, whatever else they do, perfect landing is a lot harder. So as the difficulty goes up, it gets harder to do this. But how rapidly can you get off it and cop to your part? Okay, and I yeah. guess that's really what I meant was the copping to your part. You know, it's like. So, but in a very uh, superficial way, uh, can I say I'm sorry when I know I did it? Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Well, can you? Um, is that a, of course you can. You're, it's rhetorical. Yeah, yeah, that I understand you now. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And um, did your parents ever admit error? Mine never did. Oh, Lord. Uh, I, I think hardly, but we didn't even have that kind of relationship. I mean, mm. I was the youngest of five. My mother had me when she was 40. Uh, mm. This was about hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And in which there can be love and morality and, you know, or, you know, and yeah. So it's just mind blowing when you're with someone that you're mad at and they look at you, you know, maybe they tap Thich Nhat Han or, you know, bless his spirit in some way. And they go, darling, I am so sorry. I get it. Tell me more. How have I hurt you? I really want to understand. And, you know, it's isn't that intense? So beautiful. Yeah, I'm the bad one there. <laughs> okay. What do you mean you're the bad one? I've what? got it because... That was to be my role today, and that was yeah. not the case. So uh, it's almost uh, anyway. We can go on. I, okay. I can, I can marinate this one. Yeah, that's great. And and again, being aware of our own depths and the shame that we might feel if we revealed fault, if we admitted fault, or right, or the fears, maybe that the other person will pile on because that's what happened when we were a kid. Or, you know, think about obviously um, structural factors in society where, you know, revealing certain things that someone who's privileged in that society can get away with revealing what might be career suicide or, or a potentially, le yeah, lethal threat. So it, it, it's really, it's useful to take a lot of these things into account. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you as always. All right. Um, I die in. Oh, do you know how to raise your hand? You go down to the uh, reactions button with a smiley face. You push it. There you go. Okay, so Marsha, Marsha, I'm asking you to unmute yourself. Great. Me? <laughs> Me? <laughs> Hello. You? I know. I know. <laughs> Hello. I'm a big fan of you and of of um, a forest. I listen to your iPod, your your podcast yeah. all the time. I'm not really sure what I'm going to say, except that I really enjoyed your circles, and it reminds me of like the man, the myth, and the legend, and how we think we know the person, but we, we uh -huh. get fooled a lot. And That's um, interesting. And and it just reminded me of um, like I work with nonprofit communities, and they have two bank accounts. One is for reserves, and the other is for operation funds. And um, it, it's all about security and spontaneity and planning long term and, and maybe being um, more improvisational. And we have emotional reserves like that, too. It's not just financial. Yeah. 
And um, when you're doing a financial plan, you're thinking, well, 30 years from now, I might need a new roof or I might need to pave the road and it can cost $600,000. So you have to think about that incrementally, baby steps. But emotionally, people may not feel they have enough reserves and um, they create this act which becomes a reserve. And um, you could have a, a person that's hoarding, for example, might feel that um, they don't have enough security. And then they, they, to the detriment of being spontaneous and having a good present in their life. And then someone that doesn't have any savings at all is, oh, is so overly dependent on everything in their life. Their job is their sustenance, their relationships. They don't, maybe they don't have family. So I'm just saying that it triggered a lot of, about balancing and, um, it, it, you know, it, it's it's really really nice to be able to share like this with you. I'm not really sure where this is going, but um, oh, it's good. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll just leave it there. That was good. I appreciate that. Okay, good. So I saw, I believe it was you, Diane. Have you raised, been able to raise your hand? I'm going to ask you to unmute. Here you go. Great. You have to unmute yourself there, Diane. My practice has been letting go of expectations and taking nothing personally. And that has made a huge difference in my life. Wow. I, just as I want freedom for myself, I want freedom for everybody in my life. So sometimes when I'm needy and I reach out and put pressure on somebody, I know that I'm doing that yeah. and I regret it and say so. Yeah. So the whole issue of no, no expectations and taking nothing personally is a very a freeing approach to life, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> well, you just super busted out a very wise comment, and I appreciate it. Deep teaching. <laughs> yeah. I much appreciate you and the love that you shed oh. on everybody and everything. It's a beautiful, beautiful hmm. emanation that you have. Oh. Thank you. I'm really going to take that in. That's sweet. I oh, do. do. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm very grateful that you're in my life. Well, I'm grateful you just landed a Dharma bomb here <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> so one of the things that happens when we are aware of the interior of other people is that it can be kind of poignant and disenchanting when we really realize what their morals actually are or where they're actually prepared to go or the casualness with which they're prepared to act in bad faith. It can be really stunning. Someone wrote me a kind of more private comment. You know, what do we do with people where we realize that they're just freaking self-centered and egocentric now, maybe there are reasons for it, you know, who knows? Or, but bottom line, they're just like, you know, they don't really care very much about other people. They just, you know, they kind of don't give a damn. What do you do then? Or you realize that, you know, they, they, they like you a little bit, but they're just not prepared for any kind of real depth or traffic in this relationship. That's tough. That's tough sometimes. But that's sometimes what we discover when we unpack or become more aware of, you know, the underlying depths in another person, uh, then you have to act accordingly, right? We've talked a lot about practical ways to act. There's a lot of wisdom in different traditions and in psychology in general about how to deal with, um, you know, the interior of other people when we realize that they are not really a true friend or they're not very loyal to us or they are, a, you know, the friendship is a mile wide but an inch deep, right? What do we do then? But that's sometimes what we actually discover and that's part of what's real. Um, I was stunned in certain situations where I realized that uh, a large fraction of humanity will not do the right thing if it's hard. If it's easy to do the right thing, they will come through for you, they'll stick up for you, but if there's some kind of personal risk or they have to make an effort or they have to give up their workout on one Saturday morning to help you move, mm, they're just not going to come through for you. Many people disappoint. So what's the takeaway? For me, it's to see clearly and not be disappointing oneself and to do what we can to deal with the history if we have disappointed and let other people down. 
All right, so Ed asked a question. I've lived the question at 708. Question for the ages indeed, how does a loving parent crack the act of a teenager and get to their essence to help compassionately relieve the suffering of that is adolescence? I've found that answer to be mighty elusive. I mean, I've, I've, I can relate to that question. Um, <clears throat> I think that there's no perfect answer. Uh, as parents, particularly under certain conditions, given our values as parents, we have to exercise power. No, I'm not going to let you shoot heroin every morning before you go to school. You know, no, it's not okay to be stealing from me or anybody. You know, like, no, it's not okay to just blow off high school. You know, as a capitalist plot, you just don't want to have anything to do with. No, that's just not okay. So we we exercise authority, but I think one is to um, not be irritating, needlessly, with adolescents. Stay out of uh, power struggles as much as possible. Get your fingers off the blade. Get, get your fingerprint off the blade as much as you can so that you try to arrange other forces in their life to be influential, teachers, coaches, karate teachers, um, relatives, older siblings, your co-parent maybe, you know, that. And then beyond that, and we can look back on um, people in general who can seem kind of hard to reach. Maybe it's not a teenager necessarily. Pardon me as I, as I finish here. I can, I can actually say that most parents, including me in retrospect, which I regret, most parents don't drop out of the vertical relationship to horizontal and in a vulnerable real way, not pushing an agenda, managing their own anger in a vulnerable and real way, essentially say, you know, how are you doing? And also, you know, just when you act like that, I feel sad. I feel, I don't know what's happening. Have, what, is it something I've done? Do you wish I would act differently in some way? Like, what's happening? You know, kind of a vulnerable inquiry that we come back to. If they might brush us off, come back to it uh, again and have the courage. On any given day, it seemed like a bad idea to do that, but the days turned into years. And I think this is a true statement. I'll finish on this one. It's, it seems appropriate to the larger topic that... On any given day, it can seem like a bad idea to become more confessed or vulnerable or real with another person. And on that given day, it might actually be a bad idea, okay. But if the days turn into months, that's, that's, that's like a orange flag at a minimum warning, like, hey, this... once in a blue moon, things get better on their own, often they don't. And it's time to maybe clear the air, ideally in a skillful, vulnerable, genuine kind of way. And you might ask yourself, is it, is there a, is it time to clear the air in an important relationship? Getting in touch more with your own interior, your own core, your own depths, and being, you know, and, and helping to unpack and open up and be in touch with uh, the depths in the other person. And in so doing, relieve suffering, your own and that of other beings. Yeah. It takes courage, courage, the courage to be open. I hope you enjoyed that talk. I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free.